Years and Years is a show that desperately wants to be Black Mirror, but isn't. Hello, Mommy. It's a drama about the Lyons family and how they navigate life in a dystopian near future UK. It's created by successful television writer Russell T Davies, who you'll know from shows like Queer as Folk and Doctor Who, airing on BBC One and HBO to unanimous critical acclaim. In fact, I found it hard to find many, or any, unfavourable reviews. Hardly anybody has anything negative to say. Luckily, I have plenty of negative things to say to bridge this gap and make the discourse a bit more balanced. A few clarifications first. I am talking about the TV show Years and Years and not the band, though the naming is unfortunate. And fair warning, I am going to spoil the entire plot. I don't just think Years and Years is bad either. I think it's creating a deeply harmful narrative that portrays contemporary politics with no nuance whatsoever and encourages complacency against fascism. To be clear though, I doubt that Davies is doing this on purpose. He probably isn't aware of it at all. But I'll be nice and start off with some positives. Firstly, the original soundtrack scored by award-winning composer Murray Gold is just as good as you'd expect. It captures dystopian terror in a way nothing else in years and years does. And finally, the diversity and caliber of the casting is something that should be celebrated, although the fake northern accents of the main lion's brood leave much to be desired. So that's all the positives out of the way, now it's time for the negatives, beginning with the fact that Russell T Davies doesn't understand politics. <laughs> It's generally acknowledged that the modern political spectrum goes from left to right. On the left are anarchists, communists, Marxists, socialists, and other things I happen to think are quite good ideas. On the right are capitalists, nationalists, conservatives, fascists, and things I don't think are good ideas. Then in the middle are centrists and liberals. And while liberalism is a more coherent ideology to do with supporting personal freedoms and liberties, centrism is more just about not succumbing to those extremists on the left and the right. The way centrists justify not committing to the left or the right is sometimes through horseshoe theory, a widely disliked idea that the spectrum isn't a straight line, it's curved. Here's a particularly nonsensical version of it created by centre-right pundit Dave Rubin. To summarise. Far right, you go far left, eventually you meet in the middle. The people on both the left and the right don't like being conflated by horseshoe theory, and it ignores the inherent differences with both strains of ideology, instead presenting the idea that anything extreme is evil. Episode 4 sees political discourse plagued by deepfake videos of the Labour and Conservative Party leaders, Trevor Lyle and Madeleine Barry, who definitely aren't Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May, making statements that someone in the middle is clearly supposed to see as equivalent, as a way of representing the flaws in both. Barry's deepfake says, there's one obvious solution to all the foreigners in this country. Arrest them, throw them out, and if they resist, ex ex execute them. While Lyle says, Ask me what to do with the rich, and I say, Take their homes, burn them down, and throw those bastards to the wo wo wolves. The problem is that burning down the house of someone rich isn't the same thing as actively murdering people because of their ethnicity or nationality. It just isn't. In the world of years and years, we're supposed to see these things as equivalents, a way to show that neither political party is fit for government. Since both the left and the right are bad in years and years, centrism is the only option left for the main characters, none of whom stray too far from the middle. This is because these characters are supposed to be relatable, to be ordinary, to be just like you and me. And even I have to admit that most people in the UK do fall into this middle category. Not everyone is a raging commie or a neo-Nazi. The issue is that our relatable characters fall into the same traps mainstream centrism falls into, those traps being fascism. If you want to return to crude reimaginings of the political spectrum, the leftist idea of fishhook theory, designed to counter horseshoe theory, shows the far right coming to indoctrinate the middle. All too often do centrists come down on the side of the far right because of their unwillingness both to deplatform far right thinkers and to consider any economic system other than capitalism. Perhaps unwittingly, Davies actually shows that centrism can be easily hijacked by fascism, as two of our relatable characters, Rosie and Muriel, vote for the populist four-star party. Here are ordinary people are voting for a far right political 
political regime headed by Vivian Ruck, who Davies says in an interview represents everybody. Is he trying to show that everybody is susceptible to the far right? Everybody has the potential for fascism? What he's trying to show isn't clear, but what he does show is that centrism is the gateway to the alt-right, which has led to the Nazi renaissance of modern politics. Davy says that Viv Ruck is all of us, dismissing claims that she's an allegory for Nigel Farage or Donald Trump, though she clearly is. Viv Ruck is a character who gets her demographic by scaremongering about immigrants, mainstream politics, economics she doesn't understand, and encouraging nationalism. The final two episodes reveal a subplot where the four-star party take control of overflow facilities where refugees and immigrants are detained, better known as concentration camps. Camps have negative connotations. Ruck justifies the use of these camps, called erstwhile sites, by saying that concentration camps were a British invention used in the Second Boer War. The notion of a concentration camp goes way back to the 19th century, the Boer War. They were British inventions built in South Africa to house the men, women and children made homeless by the conflict. Refugees, you see, everything is much older than we think, and everything old happens again. Now, this is entirely true. The British Empire did build concentration camps in South Africa. The British have also historically built camps in Kenya, leading to the Mau Mau uprising. They built them in Cyprus in the late 1940s to hold Jewish immigrants fleeing to Palestine, and they've used them in Wales to hold Irish political prisoners. By no means is this a complete list. Educating the British public about our country's genocidal imperialist history isn't a bad thing, and this is clearly what Davies is trying to do. What I question is having these lessons come from an openly fascist demagogue who thinks they're a good thing, when a left-wing character elucidating these issues would arguably be more effective. How the fascists are eventually defeated is also hugely oversimplified. Edith and Fran break into an erstwhile site to try and free Victor, disabling a large blink machine that prevents devices from connecting to the internet. Breaking the blink means they and all the incarcerated refugees are free to livestream the atrocities, after which… Hold on, let me check my notes. After which, they show the live stream to the police, and the police come and arrest Rook from Downing Street. The police? In Downing Street today, Vivian Rook has become the first British Prime Minister to be arrested in office. Astonishing scenes after the erstwhile scandal, as the new Metropolitan Police take Vivian Alison Rook into custody on charges of murder and conspiracy to murder. Because the police would never do anything remotely fascist, or side with the ruling elites over the population. Mom, I know your intentions are good, but aren't the police a protective force that maintains the status quo for the wealthy elites? Don't you think we ought to attack the roots of social problems instead of jamming people into overcrowded prisons? What's more ridiculous is that Ruck even can be arrested, meaning she didn't pass any secretive legislation to make her death camps technically legal. Even Hitler had the Orpa and the Gestapo and wasn't able to just be arrested. Arrested. The idea that fascist sentiments can be eliminated because of the arrest of one key figure is another misunderstanding of society. Showing that Viv Ruck is evil won't get rid of the conditions that led to her getting into power. If this actually worked, we wouldn't have Nazis anymore, but we do. What we have to do to stop fascism is tackle the ideas at the root, stop fascists from having the platforms they use to radicalise people, and stop treating it like it's an idea we should be willing to debate and engage with. We've talked about the middle, and we've talked about the right, so it's time to briefly touch on what years and years makes of the left, and it will be brief because there's very little. Davies has the same issue a lot of centrists have, which is conflating leftist theory with Stalinism. This is clear through the portrayal of the Communist Party in Ukraine. The Ukrainian army has taken control of the government. They have invited the Soviet army into Kiev to maintain stability. The scary communists apparently gain power in Ukraine and apply three times to have same-sex relationships made illegal. But the Communist Party applied to make same-sex relationships illegal, or you can't express homosexuality. That's the phrase, you can't express it. They tried to do that back in 2016. Now this is the Communist Party. This isn't a bunch of nutters, this is the People's Party. And they applied again in 2019, and this year, Third time lucky, so yeah, any day now, he's a criminal. 
This is why Victor comes to the UK and drives much of his character arc. But the thing is, the Communist Party of Ukraine was banned in 2015, before the show begins, so they didn't apply to ban same-sex relationships, let alone start executing people on suspicion of being gay. If they've had a resurgence, the show doesn't explain this. I'm not saying communist ideas don't exist in Ukrainian politics, or homophobic ideas, and for that matter, there are homophobic government officials in the UK as well, but the actual capital C, capital P Communist Party didn't exist to do any of these things. Ukraine is also making advancements in LGBT rights currently, partly because the country is attempting to join the EU, and partly because of good old-fashioned grassroots activism. It's very unlikely that they would go backwards for no reason. The only other predominant example of leftism in years and years is the Spanish Revolution. Spain's calling it the January Revolution as the so-called People's Party, Nueva Esperanza, declares itself the new government. The situation in Spain means a left-wing government is being replaced by a far-left government. In response to this revolution, the United States banned Spanish from being spoken in public, apparently forgetting that Spanish is the second most spoken language in the US and the fourth most spoken language in the world. Yes, really, they banned Spanish. It's worth noting that political instability in Spain isn't mentioned in any of the other five episodes and the beliefs of either faction aren't given, aside from being on the left. The only policy these new Spanish revolutionaries impose is a repatriation policy. We're saying Nueva Esperanza has a policy of repatriation. Anyone without citizenship is sent home. In both instances, the left only exists as a shadowy ideologue there to shuffle Victor around various European countries and continue his subplot. Edith is the only character who is even slightly centre-left, and we only know this because Celeste calls her an anarchist. I thought you were the great anarchist. She doesn't actually say or do anything anarchisty. Well, other than being so disdainful of democracy that she refuses to vote, despite registering and going all the way to the polls, and supports Rex scheme to disenfranchise anyone with a low IQ. So I propose, in order to vote, every British citizen must take an IQ test. Like it or not, she's got a point. People are thick. Hold on. Would you ban me? Not if you pass the test. Oh my god, you'd ban me. No, well, that's... Vivian Rook, she's ripping up democracy, I love it. She apparently hates voting so much she wants to legally obstruct other people from doing it. She also paints a few protest signs, which she incidentally never takes to an actual protest. These signs say free the one on them, which doesn't relate to the story in any way and seems to just be the most vaguely anarchist slogan Davies could come up with. I suppose eat the rich is too provocative. <laughs> We're also told that she spent most of her life travelling the developing world doing Greenpeace stuff. Fan once took sonnets to Syria. Never mind food, have some sonnets. Which makes her sound like the embodiment of the white saviour complex she definitely is. Outside of this paltry effort at engaging with vague ideas associated with leftism, there are no left-wing voices, no left-wing characters and no left-wing narratives. But Davies is under no obligation to portray leftist thinking, and especially not in a sympathetic light, since he obviously doesn't agree with it. So why am I bringing it up? Because in a story about combating the rising tide of fascism, it's the people on the left who fight against it. That's what Antifa are all about, opposing fascism. Without the left, years and years neglects to create a compelling counter-narrative. Its characters are essentially just victims and villains. There are no heroes. To illustrate why this weakens the story so much, I'd like to talk about Viva Vendetta briefly, another story about dismantling a fascist regime in near future Great Britain. Years and years is V for Vendetta if you completely removed V. If you've seen V for Vendetta or heard the title just now, you might correctly guess that removing V leaves almost nothing. It's this nothing that Davies has stretched into six hours of television. Whether you agree with the politics of the film or even like the film isn't the point. The point is that it has a coherent narrative, a message, and a rallying cry for revolution in the face of violent oppression. Years and Years has none of this. Our characters just sit around complaining about how bad things are in the world and how awful it is that the fascists some of them voted for are in charge and being fascists. Though you can argue that this is because they are relatable and ordinary, and violent activists like V aren't relatable and ordinary. Presumably, this is also why the small revolution at the end involves no bloodshed at all, led by Edith Lyons and some camera phones in a climax so optimistic it becomes hyperbolic. 
To make this counter-narrative problem even clearer, you can look at it in relation to the family-friendly, much less violent Star Wars franchise. A years and years version of Star Wars would be about a bunch of nice, ordinary people on Alderaan worrying about the Empire and then getting blown up by the Death Star. In other words, it would be Star Wars without Luke, Leia, Han and the Rebels. Unless Luke turns up right at the end and gets out a camera to film the Death Star, which he could then give to the space police to go and arrest Darth Sidious. Edith Lyons is the one who leads the charge to expose the erstwhile sites, but her reasons for doing so aren't as altruistic as this makes them sound. The reason she finds out about the sites and schemes to break into them is to find Victor. Victor got moved. There's no record of where he's gone. And that means they've taken him to an erstwhile site. When they're brought up at the beginning of the finale, it's because Edith is worried about Victor, not necessarily about the camps in a wider sense. I bet Victor's eating worse. Oh, do we have to? Every time. He's family and we don't know where he is. This is a minor example of the family's overwhelming selfishness and apathy. Middle class and firmly centrist, the Lionses are consistently indifferent to bigger political problems until they are directly affected, until their family members find themselves in the death camps. We see a similar issue with the bombing of Hong Xiao Dao. He did it, Donald Trump did it, his final days of office. Which serves as a gripping beginning to a thoroughly underwhelming plot detail. Oh, sh It's underwhelming because the only time the Hong Xiao Dao nuke is brought up again after the opening of the second episode is when people talk to Edith, who was there and who was poisoned by the radiation. A nuclear bomb exploded and the West just carried on. We calculate at the very least you were exposed to one gray of radiation. You might have limited your lifespan to another 20 years. 45,000 innocent people died in the nuclear attack and they are almost never mentioned outside of the characters reminiscing that it was a sad thing that happened and didn't affect them. Six months ago, um, we all thought we were gonna die. It only affects them because it leads to Edith developing a mysterious illness. I told Fran, it's asthma. You only came home because you're sick. And they are only concerned about it after the fact because Edith might die a bit earlier than she would die otherwise. There's also Victor's character arc about the struggles of immigration and trying to seek asylum. After the fourth episode concluded, social media praised it for its handling of the migrant crisis and how it showed what people go through to try and enter the UK. Except, the Lyons family are never concerned with the migrant crisis as a whole. Daniel only thinks about it when Victor is deported, and the others only think about it when Daniel, a white British citizen, and incidentally drowns trying to cross the channel. 16 other people die in the same incident, but those people aren't mentioned outside the death toll. Despite the public response, seeing the harsh realities of the migrant crisis doesn't lead to any of the Lions' sympathising with them. None of them start to help refugees, they don't protest immigration laws, and they don't raise awareness of the situation. In fact, rather than turn their anguish towards the establishment and the government who made this happen, Stephen turns his anger towards Victor, blames him, and has him sent to the erstwhile site. Muriel is the final key example of this sheer ambivalence for people who aren't main characters. During a subplot where dirty bombs are detonated in Bristol and Leeds, British citizens end up displaced and need to be rehoused. Muriel lives in an enormous mansion and is approached by the council to help house these refugees. It's Mr Briscoe from the council. About the bedroom law, he says you've got an appointment. And she outright refuses on the basis that she has macular degeneration. After a brief macular degeneration subplot, I can't see, but I'm cured. Where she has her eyesight restored by some fancy futuristic technology in less than five minutes of screen time, she tells her family not to tell the council that she is now able to house people. But don't tell the council. This is played for laughs. It's clearly a selfish thing to do. After all, she has a giant house and the means to help the refugees. Where you might expect other characters to criticise this, or for her to have some development and decide that helping people is good actually, it never comes back. They just don't help anybody except themselves, and according to the narrative, this is fine. I suppose helping others is just a bit too communist. <laughs> One specific part of Years and Years that was even spread by BBC One's official social medias for being profound is Muriel's speech in the finale. In this speech, she blames everyone for the world's problems and criticises one pound t-shirts. She says, But it's still our fault. You know why? Is that one pound t-shirt. A t-shirt that costs one pound. 
We can't resist it. Every single one of us. We see a T-shirt that costs one pound and we think, oh, that's a bargain, I love that, and we buy it. Not for best, even for fend, but nice little T-shirt for the winter to go underneath, that'll do. And the shopkeeper gets five miserable pence for that T-shirt. And some little peasant in a field gets paid 0.01 pence. And we think that's fine, all of us. And we hand over our quid and we buy into that system for life. If you're on the left, you'll see that what she's criticising is consumer capitalism and the exploitation of the poor, but she never makes that leap. Muriel identifies that this exploitation is a problem, but not that it's capitalism that leads to it. That's because centrism relies on capitalism. It can't fathom a world without it, and evidently, neither can Davies. I'd also like to say plenty of people don't think that's fine. There are people out there aware of the problems inherent with capitalism of this exploitation, who won't buy cheap things just just because they're cheap. These people are those scary leftists. The opposite worldview to capitalism, the one that aims expressly to collectivise resources and put the workers in control, is communism. But of course, in years and years, the left is bad and evil. The vilification of the left prevents the show from developing any nuance at all, because its refusal to entertain any anti-capitalist idea, or even identify capitalism as the issue, limits what it's trying to say. It's completely counterintuitive to blame everybody for the exploitation of the capitalist 1%, who by their nature are in the vast minority. This collectivised blame is dangerous and stops people from actually acting to remove these systems on a grand scale. Davies has said he didn't want to make it look like the downfall of Viv Rook led us into the sunny plains of Nirvana where all our problems will be over, and that people will still suffer, the country will go from highs to lows, from left to right. To that I say, yes, people will still suffer, because you haven't addressed that capitalism is the root of these problems. There is no radical, revolutionary message, there is no call to action, there is no substantial or sustained critique in years and years, there is nothing. This is one of the few parts of the show where you don't need to already have a left-wing mindset to see the issue when Stephen and Celeste's daughter Bethany announces she identifies as transhuman. I think I'm trans. I'm not transsexual, I'm transhuman. Transhumanism is used in the plot as an allegory for transgender rights. I want to live forever as information because that's what transhumans are, mum. Not male or female, better. It's a necessary allegory because in years and years version of the UK, discrimination against LGBTQ plus people no longer exists. Now, if it turns out that we've got a, a lovely son instead of a lovely daughter, then we'll, we'll be happy. <laughs> so Davies invents a new identity to discriminate against instead. You promise me, you liars! <laughs> and if you think you're going online, you make a sad mistake. I'm switching it off. I will go analog if I have to, so you can't read any more that shit. Judy Bowman, in a Time magazine review, discusses this more concisely than I can, writing, The implication that tech-enabled transhumanism is the logical next step after transgender identity, which has existed in some form for thousands of years, carries some pretty transphobic connotations, whether that was Davies' intention or not. I'm not sure Davies knows an awful lot about trans people, and I say this because in the first episode, her parents suspect she is transsexual, which isn't the acceptable term anymore. Is that not the word now? But you said trans. What did we call you then? I'm sorry, they keep changing the words. I don't know the difference. In years and years, transhumanism eventually becomes accepted, so accepted that Bethany is able to get various implants paid for by the government that give her what is essentially the superpower to control technology. This technology is a privilege, and you made me break the law. If I get caught, they'll strip me of this. Literally, they will pull the wires out of my body. The government owns this stuff. It owns me. These implants are so powerful, in fact, that she's able to hack into the top level of government and find out where the erstwhile sites are, and that Stephen is the one who had Victor moved. Select Victor Garaya. Transfer Victor Garaya. It's odd that the government would pay for something that allows people to access, with what appears to be relative ease, files about their illegal classified death camps.
Much of years and years storytelling relies on shocking moments with no narrative comeuppance. The bombing of Hongsha Dao at the end of the first episode was the biggest of these moments, let down by the fact in subsequent episodes it didn't amount to anything at all. All it ended up being was a scary scene and a plot contrivance to drive Edith's illness. Something similar happens with the banking crash at the end of episode 2. Stephen loses he and Celeste's house and all their money, but it doesn't amount to much other than mutual resentment leading to him cheating on her, because as said, Muriel has as a mansion they can just go live in. While these are still significant narrative events that do sort of serve the plot, there are a myriad of other scenes purely included to shock the audience that never come back. The holographic real life snapchat filters that we see in episode 1 are abandoned for the rest of the series. Hello mommy! There's a scene where a drone delivery service launches in a flash forward and the drone beheads someone on its maiden flight with its gigantic blades. As you can see, Rosie gets a new boyfriend she eventually marries, John Joe, and for some reason Edith takes it upon herself to threaten him with a large kitchen knife. Then I'd better be on the alert. You understand? Bethany and her friend Lizzie go to a shady Russian surgery boat in Liverpool where Lizzie gets a dodgy cybernetic eye fitted. We don't find out what happens to Lizzie. I'd also like to point out that contrary to the information the narrative gives us, it's been going on for decades. Cruise ships are over the docks, specially adapted as hospitals, run by Russians, Slovakians, Romanians, and people go on board for cheap operations. There was facelifts in the 90s, gender reassignment in the 2000s, and now, They've discovered transhumans. These surgery boats don't exist. There was one incident like this in Gibraltar in 1994 that I could find, and the boat was shut down because the EU said it was very illegal. Those dirty bombs I mentioned in Bristol and Leeds. We don't find out who detonated these bombs, why they did it, or what happened to the displaced citizens. The UK starts suffering blackouts and power shortages in the fifth episode, potentially due to Russian hackers, obviously. Could be Russia. Which are apparently all fine in the finale, and we don't find out who's behind them, going by a hint that Ruck's election was rigged, which she denies. It's heavily implied that the voting was rigged. You are the enemy of the people. It's possible that the government are causing the blackouts, but we're never told for sure either way. By father, the worst moments come in the third episode when the lion's sibling's father dies. Dad's dead. He was hit by a bike. Sorry! He had a scratch on his hand. That turned into blood poisoning. After getting hit by a bike courier, he develops sepsis from a scratch and dies because antibiotics don't work anymore. We never meet their father, nor do we know anything about him other than that he cheated on their mother and abandoned them all to start a new family, so it's hard to feel any kind of emotion at all about his death. His remains are aquified, which is an eco-friendly alternative to cremation where bodies are dissolved in alkaline. It's called alkaline hydrolysis, better for the environment. Put the body in a big tube, fill it with water, heat it up and is then given out to the kids as liquid in small vials. Daddy. Edith, being the absolute legend she is, downs the juicy remains of her deceased father like a shot, and this is played off as just the kind of crazy wild thing Edith is prone to doing. Edith? <laughs> Worse, the episode concludes with Stephen, who works as a bike courier himself at this point, seeing another bike courier on the road and being so filled with rage that a bike courier killed his father that he follows the man home and crushes his bike with his car. This is the episode's ending, shown with the same dramatise as the Hong Shao Dao nuke, but is literally just a very angry man running over a stranger's bike. You can't even justify this by saying Stephen is flawed, because the script's directions tell us that Edith is entirely supportive of this, and Rosie and Daniel don't object either. For some reason, we're supposed to see running over a stranger's bike as a satisfying event, like they've avenged their absent father by ruining a delivery guy's livelihood. Is years and years realistic? The people praising it think so. Across the board, its realistic and believable portrayal of where our future might go has been repeatedly invoked as one of its greatest assets, as well as its similarity to what's currently in the news. It's realistic in that if nobody acts against right-wing populism and extremism, this could be where we end up, and as we've already established, since most of the viewers are middling centrists, they aren't acting against these movements. The optimistic ending where a non-violent solution is re 
reached with the aid of structures like the police, only serves to make people think that if they bide their time long enough, eventually the fascists will be beaten by somebody, but we don't have to take an active role in doing this. It's a national version of diffusion of responsibility, a sociological phenomenon meaning people are less likely to help someone in need if they're in a group, because they assume somebody else will do it. Eventually, Edith does take on the role of the lone hero who saves the world, 10 years after the show begins. If people like Edith, or Edith herself, had taken any meaningful action at the beginning of the show, Rook wouldn't have been able to get into power. So, if diffusion of responsibility is a real thing, why do I bring this up in a point about the show's lack of realism? Because in the real world, this isn't what's happening. People have been organising and protesting oppression for centuries, and these protests are rarely completely non-violent and completely peaceful, and they are always disruptive to someone or something by their very nature. Huge historical events like the Protestant Reformation, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Civil Rights Movement, the Stonewall Riots, anti-nuclear protests, organisation against the Vietnam War, are all built on dismantling oppressive structures, be they the Catholic Church, the bourgeoisie, institutional racism and segregation, homophobic laws, and the military-industrial complex. Today, people are out protesting climate change, picketing outside ice concentration camps in the US, trying to fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline, and throwing milkshakes at fascist agitators at political rallies, even the infamous Trump baby blimp. If years and years was realistic, it would show the people fighting back, because if people fight back today, and have been fighting back for hundreds of years, then surely they're doing the same thing in this alternate world. It's unrealistic that it takes the death camps to force anybody, including Edith, to act, and it's unrealistic that a regime that's had 10 years to grow would be so easily thwarted. I'd like to finish this video by talking about the ending, because that seems fitting, and because Davies has had quite a few things to say about the people who would dare to criticise it, including that he won't be friends with them. So, um, oops. The show ends with Edith succumbing to her ambiguous radioactive asthma, having her brain downloaded onto a water-based cloud storage system, which isn't explained in any more detail. As she dies, she gives a speech that's been widely praised, but I'd like to argue that it doesn't mean anything at all. Everything you've stored, all the downloads, those bits of me that you've copied onto water, you've got no idea what they really are. I'm not a piece of code, I'm not information, all these memories, they're not just facts. There's so much more than that there. My family, my lover, they're my mum and my brother who died years ago. Their love, that's what I'm becoming. Love. I am love. She concludes by saying that she is love and she is becoming love. In dialogue, Davies said it took him 30 seconds to write. You can tell. Now, I don't have an issue with ending a show with a message of hope and optimism, especially not one as bleak as years and years would otherwise be. What I question is whether love is the message the show spreads, since so much of it is centred on pointing out that we might all become Nazis at any moment. It's amusing that the Lions have spent so much time trying their best not to help anybody, and Edith only becomes this heroic, revolutionary figure at the very end, and suddenly what we have to take away is to love each other. And I'd argue that this message of how much of everyone else are you, whatever that means, translates best to a leftist ideology founded on empathy and care for other people, even people you're not directly related to. By complete accident, Davies manages to show that the centrism he tries to pose as the only valid ideology against the extremes of the far left and the far right is the gateway to fascism. He inadvertently shows that capitalism causes most of society's problems while being incapable of comprehending this himself. It's an empty, hollow story with no anti-fascist message to combat the rising right-wing politics everyone is so scared of. What Years and Years shows is that complacency and a refusal to entertain or even acknowledge leftist ideas leads to the rise of fascism, ignoring current counter-movements and protests that are happening around the world. But maybe I'm biased. Maybe I'm too much of a filthy commie to see to the heart of Years and Years, to see to the true message lying just beneath the non-committal, pro capitalist centrism. And that message is, destroy our bikes! <laughs>